Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming out to the National Museum of Industrial History's virtual museum. Um, I am very pleased that we are uh, joined this afternoon by uh, Jim Higgins. He earned his doctorate at Lehigh University and is currently broadcasting from uh, Allentown, Pennsylvania. Uh, his work focuses on the history of American medicine with a special focus on influenza and typhoid, obviously a very timely topic with the uh, current pandemic going on. Uh, he's lectured in America and Europe, published, at numer published numerous scholarly papers, and his first book, A Brief History of Medicine and Disease in Pennsylvania, will be published by Temple University in conjunction with the Pennsylvania uh, Historical S Association later this year. Um, Jim, thanks so much for joining us. And I uh, really, really appreciate you being here. And I'm going to pass the feed off to you now, and uh, I hope everyone enjoys this great presentation. Um, also, in the, uh, if people have questions, please um, please hold them till the end. I'll be passing them off to Jim uh, in the Facebook feed. Um, but if anybody has any questions, please stick around to the end of the presentation, and uh, we'll have Jim do a question and answer session. And Glenn, is my uh, little presentation popping up the way it should? I believe so. Okay. Uh, give me one second. Okay, I think you should be good to go. Wonderful. Well, hello everyone. Uh, in this time of pandemic uh, around the world, uh, I thought I'd speak for a little while today on a, a pandemic that happened uh, just over 100 years ago. In fact, uh, the last waves of it were dying out uh, exactly about 100 years ago, 1920, 21, 22. And pay special attention to the city of Bethlehem and uh, in particular, Bethlehem Steel uh, during this era. The outbreak of influenza in 1918 marked the worst pandemic in human history in terms of number of people who were killed. Uh, the Black Death of the uh, 1300s and the virtual annihilation of Native Americans uh, in the, the New World in the 15 and 1600s, uh, kill more people by rate in the regions that are affected. But the influenza pandemic hunted into every house, every community in the entire globe and killed somewhere between 50 and 100 million people. Um, that, that massive discrepancy in, in death toll, a result of the quick speed of the pandemic and uh, poor record keeping at the time. So if, if we can transport ourselves back to Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, which was wrapped around and in, in the case of South Bethlehem was a kind of wholly owned subsidiary of Bethlehem Steel 100 years ago, you would have seen a community that was utterly uh, humming with activity. World War I is now in terms of the American presence uh, a year and a half old. But Bethlehem Steel has been producing war goods for the Entente, uh, the Allies, uh, all the way back to 1914 and early 1915. South Bethlehem itself is swelling with war workers who are coming in from not only the Lehigh Valley, but from areas far behind the Lehigh Valley. Uh, thousands of people uh, coming into South Bethlehem and trying to make some sort of of home for themselves, uh, many of them apart from their families. In fact, so many people are crowding in that we have boarding room owners that are running three shifts of sleepers on the same mattress, um, eight hours, eight hours, and eight hours with the uh, people allowing to, uh, being allowed to lay down and then uh, being forced to go off to um, either work or a bit of amusement uh, before or after work, before lying down again and, and repeating it. Bethlehem Steel generally had a policy of no government intervention of any kind in its activities. And so uh, World War I presents a sort of um, conundrum for the corporation. How much help does the corporation want? How much help does the corporation and its workers need from the local, the state, and the federal governments. 
uh, just before the pandemic began in the fall of 1918, uh, Bethlehem, South Bethlehem and, and kind of central Bethlehem, or what we sometimes refer to as downtown Bethlehem uh, today, united under the auspices of a single administration um, headed by Mayor Archibald Johnson, who was now the mayor of the combined cities of Bethlehem, as well as first vice president of Bethlehem Steel, um, and also a, um, a committed Moravian. So he had a, a number of, of different sorts of roots and connections uh, to Bethlehem and to, to Bethlehem Steel. And I think it's important when we try to understand what's going on in Bethlehem and around the world at the time and even now, um, we have to talk a little bit about the way um, that this virus moves uh, between and amongst people. So the virus itself, um, many of you have probably heard of what I sometimes refer to as the Kansas first theory, where this virus arises in uh, Camp Funston, Kansas, sometime in February, March of 1918. And while that has a very popular ring to it, and a lot of people uh, accept it without much controversy, there's actually almost no evidence whatsoever that this virus emerges in Kansas, USA. In fact, there's an awful lot of evidence that would mitigate against it, including the fact that no novel influenza virus, that includes H1N1 back in 2009, uh, has emerged outside of a relatively small set of provinces in South South uh, East uh, China. Probably, from my view and the view of a number of other historians and epidemiologists, uh, this virus emerges sometime in uh, the late uh, portion of 1917, uh, perhaps early 1918 in China, just like every other new influenza virus has done. And then through uh, shipment, ships, this is before, of course, um, airplanes, is able to seed itself around the world in just a few short months. Retrospectively, we realize that there is a wave of influenza that strikes certainly the Western world in the late winter and early spring of 1918. And then the virus, um, perhaps because of the change of temperature and humidity during the summer of 1918, uh, seems to uh, flatten out in terms of the number of people it's infecting. It doesn't go away, it's still moving between people, um, but, but it does seem to uh, flatten out a bit. August then is the critical month. August inside of two weeks, this virus in a very virulent form emerges on the west coast of Africa, uh, in Brest, France, uh, probably amongst American troops, and then uh, the very end of August in Boston, Massachusetts. And it's this Boston outbreak that we generally consider uh, the outbreak that then fosters of the general epidemic in North America, with the virus spreading out from that, that focal point uh, along mostly the rail lines. Remember roads in terms of, of cars and um, cart traffic are almost non-entities in the spread of this uh, virus, except on very localized uh, level. Pennsylvania has uh, cases, at least in Philadelphia's Naval Yard, uh, very early in September, by the third or the fourth um, and Bethlehem, because of its size, uh, and because of its location, um, would probably have been spared infection for another few weeks, but not for the centrality of the Bethlehem steelworks uh, in the war effort. The trains are running into and out of Bethlehem uh, every single day. And some of the people who are brought into Bethlehem, whether they are visitors, or they are people looking for work, or they're people connected to the steel who are doing business in places like Washington, Philadelphia, and New York, uh, will inevitably bring this virus and bring it relatively rapidly uh, to Bethlehem. The head of Bethlehem Steel's medical division, Loyal Shouty, is someone who needs to be remembered, I think, in any discussion of Bethlehem and Bethlehem Steel when it comes to the flu. Loyal Shouty is an extraordinary physician. And he's brought on to um, shore up and actually to found the medical division of uh, the Bethlehem Steelworks. 
and this is the first aid division. Uh, this is to liaise with St. Luke's Hospital. St. Luke's Hospital has spent years decrying the way that Bethlehem Steel um, kind of pushes its injured workers onto uh, St. Luke's. Many of these men uh, simply cannot pay for any medical attention at all. And so it strains uh, St. Luke's resources. Again, this is a, a relatively laissez-faire period in Bethlehem Steel's uh, history. A lot of steel workers and their family members now who remember the high wages, the relatively good working conditions, benefits at Bethlehem Steel, or remembering a Bethlehem Steel that existed from World War II on. Uh, this is the union period of Bethlehem Steel. There is essentially no living memory of the pre-World War II period at Bethlehem Steel, where workers are used and discarded uh, at will by the company. And where South Bethlehem is, yes, partly a, a town of, of neighborhoods and neighbors, but also contains huge numbers of boarding houses and men who have no family present, uh, are just there to make a buck uh, and move on uh, with their lives. Loyal Shouty does something that I haven't been able to find any private physician in any capacity to do anywhere in the United States. I've been studying influenza since 2000. What he does is, he goes up to a place named Camp Devons, Massachusetts. Camp Devons is the first major military camp in the US to be hit by this second wave of ultra virulent influenza. And by ultra virulent, I mean that there isn't another influenza virus in the history of uh, the 20th century, the 21st century, that is even a, a kind of pale comparison to this virus. Nothing even comes close in its ability to infect people and its ability to kill them. He goes up to Devons at a time when Camp Devons is losing roughly 100 men per day. Every 24 hours, 100 men, sometimes a little more, between the ages of 18 and 25, 26, uh, die in relatively short order from this virus. He goes at a time when other public health experts from Washington, D.C. Uh, go up. And one of them writes, a famous physician writes that they're being stacked like cordwood. And that based upon this mathematical progression uh, that he's seeing there, um, he actually has um, fear for the population of the planet. Shaudi probably goes in and in my estimation, uh, makes a number of observations. One, you can't simply rely upon people to take care of themselves uh, during this outbreak. You have to get them into some sort of hospital. But the hospitals and uh, surgical units at Camp Devons, and this is gonna be followed by every military camp in the country, uh, are completely overwhelmed. And so men are being brought in, uh, they're dying, and as soon as they're taken off of a cot or a bed, um, a blanket on the ground, uh, someone else is put in their place. And men are being brought in from the barracks who are in a, a dying condition, have been laying there with no place to go. Loyal Shouty takes a train back to Bethlehem and uh, towards the end of, uh, end of September, 1918, a city council meeting is called. The city council discusses um, sundry items, including this growing epidemic across the country. But then it goes into a special council meeting where it's the mayor, it's the health officer of the city of Bethlehem who essentially has absolutely no power uh, and loyal shouty. There are no records from uh, this particular uh, council meeting where we just have these, this very tight group of individuals in there. But when the council meeting is over, it seems that Bethlehem has a view of this epidemic that isn't shared yet by any city or town in the state of Pennsylvania and maybe anywhere else. And that is that this flu virus is an absolute catastrophe. This catastrophe will come to Bethlehem and that preparing for this catastrophe is the only logical course. And what they agree upon 
and this is coming probably largely from Archibald Johnson because he has both the backing of Bethlehem Steel and um, he's the mayor of Bethlehem, is that they're going to have a tight little chain of command where Archibald's at the top and he can move both the uh, bureaucracy of the city and the, uh, the bureaucracy of Bethlehem Steel. Butler's going to be responsible. He's a health officer uh, for kind of generally uh, dealing with the epidemic in the city of Bethlehem. And Laurel Shouty is going to direct most of the hands-on uh, medical efforts. And so we have this tight command that we don't see um, forged in any other city in Pennsylvania and really in many ways any other city uh, in the country, especially in the Northeast, which is hit much, much earlier um, by weeks than most of the interior of the country. So what does the flu look like? Um, this influenza strikes at least one third of people. And so one third of people on the planet will be recorded as having uh, symptoms. And that means about a third of the population is sick enough that they go to some sort of hospital or a medical treatment center. But the reality is that this influenza uh, strikes far more people than that. A lot of people never leave their homes. Uh, they never report themselves sick. 50, 60, 70% of the population at some point probably uh, comes down with this influenza. Most of the people who suffer from influenza in 1918, early 1919, are going to suffer from a more or less normal course of the flu. Um, it's probably, when, when you read um, most people's descriptions, it's probably a much more severe attack than most people have had or will have uh, in their lives. So the pains are greater. It comes on with a greater suddenness. Headaches tend to be very, very bad. Um, fever, 102, 103, a cough, that sort of thing, but still more or less a, um, a normal course of influenza illness. But there are subsets that include tens of millions of people that suffer a far worse um, course of illness. And for those people who are going to suffer a far worse course of illness, a few things stand out. One is, um, and I think that this is something that surprises a lot of people, is the epistaxis, so the nosebleeds. Um, for some studies, a quarter to a third of people who suffer in 1918, especially those who suffer from a severe course of illness will suffer uh, nosebleeds that actually gout out of the nose. And so um, it's, it's kind of squirting out of the nose or when they're speaking, it's, it's kind of a fine mist that's coming out of the nose. Um, and it's disconcerting to a lot of people who see it. One doctor who has it likens uh, his course to being beaten all over with a baseball bat. Uh, that's how bad the, the pains are. But it's the pneumonia. It's what this virus does to the lungs. Um, and in many ways, what uh, coronavirus right now is doing to the lungs of our more susceptible segments of population, uh, that is the real killer in 1918, 1919. So most people in 1918, 1919 are going to die of secondary bacterial pneumonia. Um, it, you know, it, it might be spooky to think of it like this, but an awful lot of people who are watching this presentation uh, are going to die one day of influenza followed by bronchial pneumonia or bacterial pneumonia. Um, you're going to be old. Flu is going to lay you down. Uh, it's going to knock back your immune system. Bacteria are going to grow in your lungs and you're going to succumb to um, lobar pneumonia, so pneumonia that takes place in, in the lobes of your lungs. And that's probably how the vast majority of people die of this flu in 1918. There are no antibiotics. And so we can't stop uh, the progression of symptoms from bacterial pneumonia in that way. The lungs are also an organ that don't generally take much damage um, and continue to function well. And so doctors will stick tubes uh, in people's lungs, through their um, rib cages, try to drain it. 
but it tends not to, um, to do very much. In fact, causes other uh, secondary infections. <coughs> Excuse me. But there's another group of people. Those people are aged 18 to 40. And they die generally in four or five days of primary viral pneumonia. Uh, that seems to be what people are dying of today in our, our current coronavirus outbreak. And so rather than taking the two or three weeks typical for influenza to be followed by bacterial pneumonia, uh, these are people who are developing pneumonia based solely upon the action of the virus. The virus is killing off cells, especially in the upper airways, uh, in the bronchial uh, passages, the upper lungs. This is causing a lot of swelling. And bronchial pneumonia is uh, typified by uh, inflammation and exudate. And there's also uh, a response that kind of goes haywire in younger people. People in their 20s and 30s, their early 40s have remarkably resilient um, immune systems. And those immune systems react very quickly to most pathogens that come into the body. But this can go uh, too far. And uh, people can develop what are referred to as cytokine storms. So an array of immune proteins make their way into the lungs. They actually help to kill uh, lung tissue, which they misidentify. And there's a biofeedback loop. Lung tissue is dying. And so the body sends uh, more uh, immune fashions into the lungs, and that kills more lung tissue. And furthermore, these um, cytokines are moved to the lungs by fluid. And so we also have a drowning effect. And so these young people in their 20s or 30s, the people who are most likely during most influenzas to have a three or four day course of illness, where they lay on a couch, they don't feel very well, and they get up, they go back to work and they resume their lives in very short order are the ones who are dying. And for the United States, that includes hundreds of thousands of uh, some of our most productive members of society. And in Bethlehem, it includes most of the people uh, who eventually die, whether they're connected with Bethlehem Steel or not. People indeed are turning blue, um, dark blue with kind of a underlay of a, of a livid uh, redness uh, to their skin. And it's, it's terrifying uh, for people to watch. And this is what Shaudi saw up at Devon's. This is from a British medical uh, journal, and it's published in 1919. And this is a drawing of a lung that has suffered from the primary viral pneumonia, where it's sodden with a kind of a thin fluid um, hemorrhaging and that sort of thing, uh, pus has not had the time to develop. Uh, this is just a young person who's drowned. It's often referred to as air hunger. Hey Jim, people hey are Jim. Yeah. Uh, if you click the, um, the button next to the minus sign on the bottom there. Let's see. Button. Down where it says like 72% there. Oh, okay. Yep. The one right to the left of the minus sign. That'll All right. put you in, that'll, there you go. Good. Yep. Perfect. And um, these, these younger people, uh, every single minute that they're remaining alive, and it's awful to think of, but doctors write about this, their lungs are losing uh, steadily the capacity to exchange uh, air with their bloodstream. And so, They'll spend hours um, deep breathing and then switching to short, rapid breathing uh, to try to alleviate the feeling of, of suffocation until they, they finally succumb uh, to the infection. This is a drawing taken from the same uh, British Medical Journal, 1919. And this shows a lung that has uh, suffered for a couple of weeks longer than the previous slide. It's a lung that has been uh, torn apart by bacterial pneumonia. The bacteria have, called, have caused abscessing on the surface of the lung, hemorrhaging. And this is a sort of um, everyday uh, bacterial pneumonia uh, that doctors see uh, both in 1918 and in, in 2020. And this is again, probably how most people die 
1918-1919. And this is a sketch of a young man, uh, 19 years old, 20 years old, again, the British Medical Journal. And you can notice around his eyelids, his mouth, his ears, uh, his throat, the discoloration, cyanotic discoloration, as his body progressively loses the ability um, to provide his um, extremities, his skin, and then later his internal organs uh, with oxygen. This is a fatal case. So Bethlehem hits well above its weight in 1918 in terms of uh, power in, in Harrisburg. Bethlehem Steel is the number one munitions producer uh, in the country. And in the case of some authors, it's the number one munitions producer on the planet, outdoing Vickers and Krupp's, uh, Westinghouse, and, and any other comers. It produces uh, guns, unloaded and loaded shells, parts for submarines, uh, steel plating, uh, essentially the entire panoply of uh, material that you need to wage war uh, in the early 20th century. And after that city council meeting um, and conferring with some military authorities from the ordinance board uh, who are in Bethlehem and who are lazying with Bethlehem Steel, Bethlehem Steel and the military decide to ask uh, Benjamin Franklin Royer, who's the acting commissioner of health for the state of Pennsylvania, uh, for a quarantine. They want a quarantine on the Lehigh Valley cities of Bethlehem, Allentown, and Easton. And the reason why they reach out to the state is that they had reached out to Allentown. And Allentown and Bethlehem, even at this point, 1918, their neighborhoods run into one another. And for people who aren't familiar with the two cities, uh, it's very easy to drive through the neighborhoods, pass from one city into the other, without even knowing that you've done so, unless you pass through on a road or a street um, where there's a, a county or a city marker. And so Bethlehem's officials, Bethlehem Steel's officials, realize, look, if we're just going to have a ban in Bethlehem on crowds, it's not going to matter that much if Allentown's not going to do the same thing, and to a lesser extent, Easton. At first, Allentown had decided that they would probably come along with it. But in a, a public meeting, uh, Allentown's mayor and city council will step away and say uh, to Bethlehem Steel's officials and uh, Bethlehem's officials, look, Here's the reason why you guys are afraid in Bethlehem. Uh, South Bethlehem is a filthy, filthy city. You can get, according to the mayor of Allentown, a couple carloads of refuse uh, if you drive down any single block in South Bethlehem. And we're trying to fight in this war to prevent or end Prussianism. And that's exactly what you're trying to institute now. You're trying to have government officials step in and tell us what to do. And we're not part of this fight and we're not going to be a part of this fight. So a couple of officials from Bethlehem Steel load up in a car and make the kind of bumpy journey out to Harrisburg where they meet with Royer. Royer's an interesting character. Uh, he's just taken over from the longtime head of uh, the Department of Health of the state of Pennsylvania, a man named Samuel Dixon, uh, who founded the department in 1905 and was its chief until he died in February of 1918. Um, Royer had been acting as his chief executive for about a decade. Dixon, if you will, is kind of a, a velvet glove. Um, he knows the goals that he wants to, to meet with public health, but he also knows how to speak to politicians and powerful people. Royer is the attack dog. And I, I admire Royer a great deal. But at this point, he's probably not exactly the man for the job. Um, he sees public health as um, tantamount to the, the well-being of his uh, state and its, its communities. And he doesn't like being questioned. So when these guys from Bethlehem Steel come in and sit down with Royer, Royer actually is um, on board with the idea of a quarantine. He thinks it's a great idea. Furthermore, in 1905, the legislation that created the Department of Health created some of the strongest legislation in the country in terms of, of health law. Uh, 
And some of these laws that you see being uh, used right now, some components of the law uh, by the current governor Wolf of Pennsylvania, when people are asking, well, you know, how can you shut down uh, businesses? How can you shut down places of worship, schools? Because we made a law 115 years ago that gives them the authority to do so. Uh, the State Department of Health in that narrow band of its authority is probably the most powerful um, department in the entire state of Pennsylvania then or now. And yeah, they can shut down businesses and they move to do so. In fact, Royer says, not only am I going to quarantine, um, and sometimes referred to a quarantine, it's really a crowd ban. Uh, the cities of the Lehigh Valley, I'm doing it across the entire state of Pennsylvania. And so at the behest of Bethlehem Steel, Pennsylvania enacts the most stringent uh, requirements for crowd banning in the entire country throughout the course of the 1918-1919 pandemic. It's not that Royer wouldn't have gone down the same road were it not for Bethlehem Steel, but that has to remain an unanswered question. What we do know is that Bethlehem Steel and Bethlehem Steel alone goes down and speaks to him in Harrisburg uh, in late September, early October, 1918. And the result is a statewide crowd ban. The crowd ban is meant to, as we would say today, and as people have become more familiar with in the last week or two, flatten the curve, right? So we're trying to flatten the curve throughout the country today with coronavirus. You're not going to be able to stop once it gets into a community, an airborne virus, uh, from moving from one person to another. That's an absolute impossibility. But what you can do is you can slow down the rate at which it infects people. And by slowing down the rate at which it infects people, what you hope to do is to buy time for hospitals, for emergency hospitals, for uh, healthcare workers to be called up, for masks to be made, and all these other things that we're doing in 1918, early 1919, and that we're frankly doing again 102 years later. So what does a state order at the behest of Bethlehem Steel um, demand? Number one, it demands that all entertainment venues be shut down. So we have this kind of odd um, occurrence of high school and college football games, for instance, in the fall of 1918, being played with uh, no spectators. Vaudeville shows, are shut down, Nickelodeons are shut down, theaters are shut down, dance halls are shut down. Any place that people congregate uh, like that are shut down. Alcohol sales are banned except for medicine. But why alcohol? Well, there are very few things that people do, especially after work for entertainment in 1918, right? You don't have television, uh, you don't have your home entertainment systems. And so one author has said, you know, it's words formally arranged or the drinking of alcohol uh, that provide people with entertainment. So words formally arranged, reading books, reciting poetry, things of that nature, or you go out to a saloon or a social club and you drink. And where there is alcohol, generally you have clout, uh, crowds. This gets mixed in also with the industrial um, effort to tamp down on the amount of drunkenness that they're seeing in their workers. So Bethlehem Steel itself, um, is is involved in this effort we don't you know alcohol is bad for a number of reasons um not the least of which is it cuts down on worker productivity it's left up to local communities whether they want to close houses of worship or schools for its part bethlehem um and again i'm saying bethlehem but the mayor himself is the first vice president of bethlehem steel uh, bethlehem immediately closes all houses of worship and it closes uh schools so elementary schools, secondary schools are all shut down. You also have, and I don't wanna to pull too many parallels today, but you have relatively honest, open communication uh, with local officials uh, between the state government and Bethlehem uh, and between Bethlehem Steel and Bethlehem's managers. They realize that there is no federal help coming. The federal government really isn't in the, um, business of, of medicine and public health at the time. There's no CDC, there's no NIH, uh, no Homeland Security, Health and Human Services, none of that exists. And because this isn't hitting one community, but it's hitting all communities, then 
the resources that a community has at hand are the resources generally that it's going to be able to rely upon. The state can't send um, really anything to you uh, to help you out. But Bethlehem's ban goes a lot further. Bethlehem bans, uh, quarantines, all dormitory equipped schools. No one is allowed on or off after the 4th of October. So that includes Lehigh University, um, Moravian College. Uh, there's also a dorm for the Bethlehem Business School. And if you're not off campus, then you can't leave. Your parents can't visit you. And that's enforced uh, by the local police, the local constables. Coffee houses are raided and people are arrested. And the reason why I use this example is because Bethlehem is not just going after um, alcohol sales. It's, it's, it's not having a kind of on again, off again um, push against crowds. It goes into coffee houses and arrests everybody sitting there drinking their coffee, uh, the proprietor of the shop, and throws them in jail. And it does this a number of times at hotels, uh, coffee houses, cafes, to enforce not just the ban, but to enforce the notion that people are going to get behind um, this ban and this, this social distancing, as we call it today, um, by force of law, if that's what it takes. But Bethlehem and Bethlehem Steel, though, take it a step further. And this is probably why, along with the stringent crowd control, uh, Bethlehem has such a low rate of death. And we'll get to that at the end of the presentation. So one of the things that's very difficult to, to quantify, and historians out of the University of Michigan and other areas have tried to quantify uh, social distancing measures and their effect on the 1918 uh, pandemic. One thing that historians tend not to try to quantify are emergency hospitals, right? So every community that flu comes to, and that's every community on the planet, uh, its standing hospitals are overwhelmed within three, four, five days of the first infection. That's why we see the Javits Center in New York City being converted into an emergency hospital. Because the public health officials know no matter what you do at the conventional hospitals, you're not going to have enough beds, right? Loyal Shouty probably realized by looking at Devons that a hospital isn't just a place with the word hospital on it. A hospital is a place where people go and if that hospital isn't set up in an orderly fashion, if it's not set up by wards, if it can't be rationally managed, then it's really just a place that people go to become sicker and die. Bethlehem Steel opens up an emergency hospital in a neighborhood called Northampton Heights. As far as I can tell, that emergency hospital, um, the site of it was paved over about 55, 60 years ago uh, to make room for the basic oxygen furnace. Bethlehem Steel doesn't use the emergency hospital just for its workers. That hospital's there for everyone in Bethlehem. And Bethlehem Steel underwrites in its entirety the entire financial cost of the emergency hospital. All the cots, all the sheets, all the bedding, all the medicine, all of the food, all of the payment to um, doctors and nurses, the underwriting of people who are coming in as volunteers. This is not underwritten by the city of Bethlehem or the county of Northampton. This is underwritten entirely by Bethlehem Steel. And within a few days of its opening on the 5th or the 6th of October, Bethlehem Steel says, oh, and by the way, this emergency hospital will be expanded as necessary um, to whatever size Loyal Shouty thinks it needs to be expanded. Loyal Shouty manages the emergency hospital. The emergency hospital is the epicenter of the treatment of most people with flu uh, in Bethlehem in 1918, early 1919. He brings some military doctors over from Camp Crane and some orderlies at Bethlehem Steel asked to be brought over. Remember, they're liaising very closely with the military because the military has uh, one general officer and a number of field officers at all times on the premises. And so there's a place where people can be taken from their homes, from their boarding houses, and taken for what amounts to professional medical care uh, in the time and the place of 1918. And so unlike many of the steel towns that run up and down the Monongahela and the Allegheny and the Ohio rivers out in Pittsburgh, 
we don't see a phenomenon in Bethlehem occurring that we see in those other uh, mill towns. And that is men who are there without families, with no one to take care of them, they're surrounded by strangers, getting worse and worse and worse. No one's keeping them fed. No one's keeping them dry because they can't rise out of bed to relieve themselves. And so they're lying in their own foulness. Instead in Bethlehem, when you're sick, you notify the emergency hospital, uh, you notify the police, you're taking the emergency hospital and you're taken care of. And in my estimation, uh, that saves dozens and dozens of lives. We actually have house to house searches, boarding house searches, where authorities are going around and saying, is there anyone sick here? If they are, let's get them out of here and get them down to the emergency hospital. There may have been uh, mass burials. We know that burials are backing up in Bethlehem. Uh, and if there is a mass burial, that mass burial would have taken place on St. Michael's. Um, it's relatively difficult, a ground penetrating radar study uh, that I was part of about a decade ago, um, isolated some disturbed ground. There's anecdotal evidence that it happened. Uh, but what we don't have are bodies stacking up in mortuaries. We don't have them stacking up in hospitals uh, like we do in other steel towns out in Western PA or in Philadelphia, uh, just 50 or 60 miles from Bethlehem. And so it is a relatively measured response uh, to the flu. It's a response that tamps down on the panic. It's a response that uh, allows us to avoid in Bethlehem uh, the worst sights and the worst smells uh, of the epidemic. And understand how quickly this can spiral out of control. News came out of Madrid today that they're using an ice rink as a morgue, as a temporary morgue. So even in the 21st century, uh, these sorts of things can spiral out of control very quickly. They do so in communities all over Pennsylvania and the Northeast, the upper Midwest, but we don't see that happening in Bethlehem. So Bethlehem steel uh, does not lose its production momentum in the fall and the early winter of 1918, 1919, right? It keeps producing uh, war goods. We don't see a faltering uh, in its output. And I think that probably more, um, and this may be a jaded view, but when you consider that Bethlehem Steel uh, made little or no effort to ameliorate uh, the plight of its workers and their families during any other epidemic uh, in the late 19th, and early 20th century, um, I think more than anything else, what Bethlehem Steel wanted to do was protect production. If you can protect production, you protect profits, we all know the massive bonuses, some of the greatest bonuses ever paid out uh, in American industrial history uh, to its directors during 1918 um, and 1917. And I think that that was their number one goal, uh, protect the economy, protect production, not necessarily um, or altruistic reasons in terms of taking care of workers for whom they've evinced uh, little or no concern about uh, for the last several decades. Be that as it may, what is the uh, consequence? What are the benefits of the way that Bethlehem Steel, through uh, the auspices of Archibald Johnson and others connected to the government of Bethlehem, uh, what are the, the benefits that the people of Bethlehem uh, experience? Number one, I don't think there's a city in uh, the country and certainly not a mill city, a heavy industrial city of similar size to Bethlehem uh, that suffers a death rate that is as low as Bethlehem's. And I think it's interesting to note that we're not seeing a lower morbidity rate. People are still getting sick at an extraordinary clip uh, in Bethlehem in the fall of 1918. They're not dying at the same rate, okay? They're being taken care of. And I think that's very, very important. When we look, um, at the, the rate of dying and death in the mill cities uh, in Western PA. And these are just, just uh, Braddock, Butler, Duquesne, Homestead, Johnstown, McKeesport, and McKees Rock. When we look at uh, the rates of flu and pneumonia um, deaths between 1910 and 1917 here, uh, Bethlehem is, is doing pretty well. But when we look at the, the rates of flu and pneumonia uh, deaths per 100,000 in 1918, Bethlehem stands out. Uh, Bethlehem's rate of uh, mortality for combined flu and pneumonia deaths 
uh, averages between four and 700% lower than the rest of these cities. So this to me is not an anomaly. Um, this isn't you know, 10 or 15% lower death rate. This is an extraordinary uh, disparity in deaths between Bethlehem and the rest of these towns. There's another town, Manesson, which is a steel town uh, out in Western PA that I didn't include on here because its records are very scattered. But its death rate is probably the worst, um, with up to two to two and a half percent of its entire population dying uh, in 1918 because of the flu. And Bethlehem's um, portion of its population uh, dying is about 0.003 percent. And so uh, an extraordinary difference in terms of uh, mortality. It also doesn't allow the flu to very easily uh, propagate a third wave that is devastating to communities uh, in the winter of 1919. San Francisco, for instance, weathers the uh, fall wave uh, very well, and its winter wave in 1919 uh, essentially puts it right up there on the average um, of mortality rates uh, with similarly sized cities because uh, the third wave ends up being devastating. We don't see that in Bethlehem in the winter of 1919, in part because a lot of these draconian measures that Bethlehem institutes are continued through the early part of 1919. We have private funerals um, with either no one or half a dozen people allowed in attendance um, throughout January, February of 1919. Schools are very slow to reopen. The emergency hospital doesn't close down um, and, and kind of uh, give up shop in November, December. It stays open uh, through early 1919. And it's because they're looking for this next shock. Um, and Bethlehem Steel sees its, its most important uh, task in terms of allowing production to continue. And remember, the Treaty of Versailles isn't signed uh, until well into 1919. So there can be a resumption of hostilities. We still have to keep production up. Um, and Bethlehem doesn't see a devastating third wave simply doesn't see a devastating third wave that other communities do see. So I wanna thank everybody for listening. If anybody has any questions, I'm perfectly happy to take them. All right, Jim, if you get out of your uh, screen share there. Okay, I, I hit it off, okay. so All good. Right. Yep, you're good. All right, um, somebody, the only comment I think we had was somebody had said, uh, you know, if the, the everything was instituted about two weeks earlier, it would have made a huge difference because the Philadelphia um, Liberty Loan Parade was at the end of September. Yeah, the Liberty Loan Parade, um, every community essentially in the country has a Liberty Loan Parade on the 28th of September, 1918, even really small towns. If you look up in your, your local newspaper, you'll see them. Um, the Liberty Loan Parade in Philadelphia, it probably is, and I agree, it probably is uh, the event that seeds the pandemic, uh, I'm sorry, the virus throughout that city. Um, Philadelphia is a focal point, uh, as are all large cities, uh, when we're looking at airborne viruses. Um, and Bethlehem itself, Allentown itself, are focal points for infection in places like Hanover Township or Saucon Valley or Mukunji. Um, they're places where people go for um, entertainment, markets, commerce, so on and so forth. Um, the Liberty Loan Parade, I gave a presentation back in October down at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania where the current uh, director of the Department of Health of Philadelphia uh, sat next to me. And the, the loan parade probably could not have been stopped. It probably couldn't have been stopped because the state law that charters the Philadelphia Department of uh, Health and Charities uh, reads that the, the director of the Department of Health can be uh, fired essentially for any reason that the mayor wants. So you're gonna have the largest gathering of people, including the mayor, senators, judges, industrialists um, in Philadelphia, certainly the largest by rate 
since the uh, 1876 exposition in Philadelphia. And this is part patriotic duty. We don't see as many cases um, as I think people think we see in the days leading up to uh, the parade. And if the Department of Health or the Director of Health had tried to stop it, uh, my sense is that the mayor would have fired him on the spot and hired another guy. And the, um, the example I use, you know, Philadelphia cancels its um, St. Patrick's Day parade. Uh, this isn't like canceling that. It's not like canceling the Mummers parade, right? This is a once in a lifetime um, gathering. And so my example is what would it have taken to cancel the Eagles celebration after they won the Super Bowl a couple of years ago? I don't want to say the Eagles celebration is only once in a lifetime. My sense is that it probably is. Um, but what would it have taken to convince the city of Philadelphia um, to cancel that, that gathering uh, where people are standing there waiting for 12 hours overnight in the cold? It's very, very difficult. Add in a world war, add in the kind of patriotic uh, duty that people have, and it's very difficult. I think my generation, we feel it right after September 11th. And then you have to go right back to uh, Pearl Harbor to kind of feel that kind of, of sense of duty and patriotism that throws people together. And um, yeah, it's an awful, it's an awful uh, event in hindsight. And it really does, I think, seed that virus. Within one week, we have um, the greatest uh, mortality acceleration uh, in the country. Um, but hindsight is 2020. Hindsight is 2020. Sure. <laughs> um, someone else asked how, um, sorry, let me find it. Um, they had it said that they read part of the reason for um, the higher death rate for people aged 18 to 40 was because they had not been exposed to a similar flu strain when they were children. And people who are older might have built up immunity that way. Is there any truth to that? There seems scientifically to be some uh, truth to it. So we discussed this in terms of. Um, original sin. Um, it sounds like an odd term, but the kind of viral or influential original sin. So the flu virus that you're first exposed to as a child is the one that you will best react to as an adult. Okay. So for most of us, my age, um, I'm in my early forties, uh, that's going to be H3N2, which has been circulating since 1968. Uh, when it took over from H2N2, which had been circulating since 1957. And so that's probably why we see so many deaths amongst uh, kids a couple of flu, uh, flu seasons ago when H3N2 was circulating uh, so widely. And that is probably part of the reason. What becomes difficult is the crossover event or the jump event that occurs with this virus. There seem to be a couple of different ways that scientists look at it. So we have samples of this virus from the early spring of 1918, going right through to the summer of 1918. And the earliest samples of this from March and April of, of 1918, uh, they're taken from people who pass away from this virus. People don't, you know, doctors don't know that there's anything odd going on, but they do keep uh, samples generally in paraffin. What it shows us is an avian virus with some mammalian traits. And kind of like by May and June, you're getting a, a mammalian virus with some avian traits. And by August, uh, you've got a human influenza virus. And so was this a quick crossover event from birds? Did it spend some time in a mammalian host, uh, most likely a pig? Um, so how quickly did it jump over? What we can tell you is this, in 1918, as in 1957, as in 1968, uh, we see some of the same thing occurring in 2009, 2010. Younger people in their 20s and 30s tend to have a stronger immune reaction to pandemic strains of the flu. And in this way, an older person's immune system may be working um, less strenuously, but that ends up being a, a good thing um, where your body isn't turning on itself in a kind of autoimmune biofeedback loop uh, that ends up damaging uh, your own body and adding to 
uh, the damage that the virus and maybe follow on bacteria are wreaking uh, in your lungs. And so, but it is very interesting that there, there is this theory and it's gaining more strength um, that there is a um, kind of an original influenza first sin that you have when you're a kid and that that virus that you are first exposed to is a strain that you're going to be able to best fight 30, 40, 50 years later. And that viruses that come along afterwards, you're not going to have a, um, the same sort of reaction to. Very interesting. Very interesting. Um, someone else had asked um, if you know or could compare the response of Bethlehem Steel to the response of uh, Hershey, another company town in Pennsylvania. Well, this is actually very interesting. Um, so Bethlehem Steel, as far as I as far as I can find, and I started studying the flu um, in 2000 out in Pittsburgh when I was earning my master's at Duquesne University, and none of the Pittsburgh uh, none of the Pittsburgh steel companies had anything like the response that Bethlehem Steel had. Hershey is interesting to me because I'd gone to Cuba uh, on vacation uh, not quite two years ago, a year and a half ago, and then went down uh, with my wife to um, the Hershey Hotel uh, last January. And I didn't realize until I was uh, speaking to an archivist there that they had a company town in Cuba. And it just opened up in 1918. And, you know, it was kind of self-contained with houses for the supervisors and middle-class people, you know, managers and then, and then workers. And so I hit on the idea that I wanted to see, because island communities are very interesting to study when it comes to an airborne virus. Um, I wanted to see how this uh, played out there and whether or not there are any differences between how a Hershey, uh, company handled it in Cuba and how they handled it in Pennsylvania. And as I'm getting ready to apply for a research visa, um, the president of the United States decides that we're going to reinstitute this embargo uh, on Cuba. And it becomes much more difficult to do any sort of research. In Hershey, Pennsylvania, because I haven't done any uh, particular research there, I can't quote morbidity or mortality rates. Um, what I can say, however, is that I would suspect that the mortality rates would be lower than your steel towns only because the ferrous metal industries uh, tend to produce compromised lung function in their workers. And this tends then, um, you know, a population that has a high death rate when flu is not present will have a higher than average death rate when flu is present. Hershey, Pennsylvania, I suspect has a lower uh, morbidity and mortality rate in normal times, and therefore it's going to have a lower morbidity and mortality rate uh, in epidemic times. But it's one of the places that I do want to take a look at. Cool. Um, I'll combine uh, two questions here. Uh, what did they do uh, to care for patients besides make basic cleanliness and basic needs? And do you know how many uh, beds the emergency hospital uh, held? So uh, beyond kind of basic TLC, um, Bethlehem Steel uh, paid for things like pneumonia jackets, which you may or may not have had uh, much of an effect. It's kind of a straight jacket almost that you put on and you tie people up, um, kind of keep them sitting up so they're um, kind of rigid. But in your, you know, in your response to influenza, um, that TLC is the best that, that anyone could do at the time. They'll use drugs like caffeine, um, what we call today uh, digitalis, uh, to stimulate the heart. To tamp down on the coughing, they'll use uh, morpha derivatives, so maybe grains of, of, of uh, opium, um, morphine. Um, and, and, you know, it's used today in a lot of uh, prescription uh, cough medicines to cut down on the coughing. Keeping people fed and uh, warm though can't you know it's something that we don't want to underestimate even today you know we have this kind of argument about whether or not um azithromycin is going to do anything well you know my sense is that since azithromycin is an antibiotic it's going to have no effect on a coronavirus at all except perhaps for stalling um, a secondary bacterial infection and so when you get a viral infection today besides a very very short list of drugs that you tend to have to give in a very small window uh, 
uh, immediately after infection or one or two days after infection. There isn't even much we can do for you today uh, besides, you know, if we have to, putting you on a ventilator. Um, but, you know, giving you the, the cough medicine to cut down on the coughing, which can cut down the inflammation of the upper bronchial system, um, the fact that we're, we're keeping you warm, fed, uh, dry, these are all very, very important things and tend to help you um, cut down on the rate of a secondary bacterial infection, which again, the, the stupendous kind of frightening four and five day deaths from first symptoms aside, most people do die two to three weeks after infection with the flu in 1918, early 1919 from bacterial pneumonia. And so if you can do things to support the body systems, to stop you from getting weakened, um, to keep you in a generally healthful state, uh, then these, these have, uh, I think, a great effect. And I've never come across a single instance, and you see this in a lot of communities, where in Bethlehem, you have a shortage of drugs. I can't find any document that suggests that Bethlehem Steel is somehow getting their hands on drugs uh, that other communities can't get their hands on. But it seems like not only do we have a, an emergency hospital, but it's a well-stocked emergency hospital. For the number of beds, I've never been able to come across uh, a hard and fast number, though I can tell you that at any one time, uh, a couple and at times a few hundred people are being cared for at the emergency hospital. So if you extrapolate 200, 250, 300 uh, cots, beds, couches, uh, things like that for people to, to lay on, which is extraordinary. When you think that you don't have big box stores and that sort of thing, you know, they're, they're pulling these beds, they're pulling these cots from somewhere. You don't have Amazon. So where are you pulling them from? <coughs> Pardon me. I'm not sure. Um, but they pull them, they get them, they get them in there in rows. They get the bedding, the pillows, um, the covers, and they're ready to go. <coughs> Very interesting. Um, I think there's a couple other questions, but we're going to wrap it up. Um, Jim, I'll send you those questions. And, um, you know, if anybody has any questions on the follow-up, I'll be happy to uh, send those along to Jim and uh, relay his response. Um, Jim, I just want to thank you again for joining us and delivering oh, that you. amazing presentation. Um, obviously, strikes very close to home right now with the ongoing health situation. Um, everyone out there, if you enjoy the presentation and you're able, there are several ways that you can help support the museum while we're closed. Um, including purchasing memberships, uh, shopping our online gift shop, adopting artifacts, uh, and more. Uh, you can find out those ways to help us out at nmih.org. Uh, we also have several other upcoming presentations, just like this one, uh, including experts from Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. If you'd like to learn more about those, stay tuned our, uh, right here to our Facebook page or head to our website at nmih.org to find out more. Uh, thanks again, Jim, and have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you, you as well.